Would you finish the phrase, Mockingbird is about? Understanding each other better. Mockingbird is about empathy. Open-mindedness and acceptance. Identifying with a center other than your own. Understanding. Mockingbird is about healing. The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. What inspired Katherine Erskine to write Mockingbird? Does she ever get writer's block like the rest of us? And what happens when your book becomes a play? We'll find out the answers to these questions and more when we meet the author, Katherine Erskine, because you know, she's right here next to me. Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm Matt Fetters and Kathy Erskine. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for inviting me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, let's dive right into Mockingbird and let's start with the main character, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Describe her for those who are either unfamiliar with the book or it's been a while since they've read the book. And use three adjectives for me. How would you describe Caitlin in three adjectives? I would say she's very perceptive and honest and persistent. Yeah, um, and as you developed her, you also made the choice to, she has Asperger's. Right. T tell us how that came about. Well, my daughter was actually diagnosed with Asperger's and I realized that I kind of understood what it was like from the outside for people to try and understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then as a mom, I got to know what it was like for her from the inside and I wanted, kids in particular to be able to understand that for themselves. Um, you've said that when you started writing this, it just kind of poured out of you. Um, kind of take us through the evolution of the story and was it always, the way it ended, was it that way at the beginning or does it kind of you know, evolve as you write? It, it definitely evolves. Uh, characters just kind of show up in my head and start talking and uh -huh. that, that's how a story begins for me. Right. And with this one, I actually started with uh, three voices. I had the mom and her perspective. I had her older brother and his perspective, and then I had the young girl. And I quickly realized that the most interesting voice was that of Caitlin. And we didn't really need the, the mom and the brother because the reader was sort of like that, that was sort of looking at things from the outside and questioning and wondering what was going on. Right. Uh, and then while, while I was writing Mockingbird, the Virginia Tech shootings occurred, and I was, trying to explain that to my own kids, which you can't really explain, right. and wondering how my daughter was processing that, and then I wondered how would the character in my book process that, and what if it directly affected her? What would happen then? So that is how that part of the story kind of got incorporated. Mm -hmm. And when you're deciding to incorporate that into the story, is it, do you kind of go, eh, maybe I will, maybe I won't, or was it like, oh yeah, this is going in? Yeah, it just sort of creeps in and becomes natural. It's just, I'm supposed to be there, it feels right. like. You, there's also a lot of reference to To Kill a Mockingbird in here. How yes. did that come about? That was interesting too. I was probably at least halfway through writing the book when I, it was this niggling thing. I've, who does this voice remind me of? Caitlin is reminding me of someone. Is it somebody I know? What, where is this <laughs> voice coming from? And then I finally realized she was reminding me of Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh -huh. who of course is like six or seven when the, the story opens. So it's appropriate for her to be frank and honest and maybe say things that um, you know aren't too polite and uh, but for Caitlin, who hasn't learned all those filters that girls by fifth grade have usually learned, right. she is going to sound open and honest like a, like a six or seven year old. Then I realized the other similarities, that there was no mom, that the uh, older brother was kind of a good kid who told her how to do everything, and I already had Devin as being an Eagle Scout, right. and then the dad was sort of distant, and the story, both stories are, are about tolerance and understanding. So uh, then I thought, well, 
Devon would be the kind of kid, her older brother, who would like the story To Kill a Mockingbird, maybe watch the movie, maybe the two of them watched it together, and maybe he would nickname her Scout, and that's how that part developed. Right. And, and a great relationship between Caitlin and Devon that you see through her remembrances and everything. Uh, just tell us a little bit about how you came out to, you know, why did you go that way with, with that relationship? I guess I was um, unintentionally modeling it on my own family. Uh -huh. um, my daughter, even though she's not like the girl in the book, um, did, does have an older brother you know, who was trying to tell her what to do and explain things to her. Not that she listened, but you know, he was trying to um, right. tell her how to do things. And that kind of kid, I also figured for somebody in a family, sometimes the kids understand each other better than, right. than the adults. So it made sense for her brother to be her helper. Yeah. Um, as, anytime any of us read a book, we have a voice we hear in our head, whether it's the character's voice that we think they're going to sound like or the author's voice. And one of the great things we get to do here on Meet the Author is have the author read from their work. So we'd love sure. you to have, read a passage here for us and kind of set it up for us and tell us where we are in the story. Okay. Uh, well, this is where Caitlin has just snuck into Devin's room. Her dad has kind of sealed that off, just is trying to seal off the memories and the pain and doesn't want her in his room. But she has snuck in and she's trying to um, kind of connect with him and think about how they used to watch To Kill a Mockingbird and how he called her Scout. And uh, so this is of uh, the, the end of that particular chapter. I wonder if Devin was trying to help someone like me when the bad guy with the bullet stopped him. The first time we watched To Kill a Mockingbird, I waited through the whole movie for the dad to shoot a mockingbird. He'd already shot a dog, and he was a good shot. No one shot a bird for the whole entire movie. At the end, I said it was the stupidest name ever for a movie. Devin said I didn't know what I was talking about. This year he read it in English and he said the title makes perfect sense and this is what it means. It's wrong to shoot someone who is innocent and was never going to hurt you in the first place. I still didn't get it and said, but you told me the dog was sick and he was going to hurt them. And Devin said, it's not about the dog. It's about people. You shouldn't hurt innocent people, Scout. That's what it means. I guess the evil school shooters didn't listen in English class because they did not get the meaning of that book at all. Very good. That's always fun to hear the author's voice reading those words that they've written. Uh, we also have a lot of questions and comments from our students about the book. So let's hear what they have to say. But first, just a reminder, you can join our conversation with author Katherine Erskine via Twitter or phone. And now let's hear what our students have to say. How does she know what autistic kids think? Like, um, does she, has she worked with kids with autism or ha does she actually have autism herself? Was there like a, a certain individual who had Asperger's that um, like, Gave you the idea towards the book. Do you have to do any like research um, about people with Asperger's? Did you have to like meet them? I'd like to ask her, you know, like, how she came to the conclusion that you know she would pick a character like this, and also you pick you know, pick you know, pick a girl because normally I happen to know a lot about you know autism, you know, and it's mainly um, you know, boys who have this condition. A lot of great questions there. Let's take them, mm -hmm. we'll go in reverse order, the last one we heard first. So main character, girl versus boy, how'd you make that decision? I guess I wanted to focus on a girl because there are stories out there about boys on the spectrum and there are some girls out there so I, I wanted them to have a story. Also when I was dealing with kids as young as that, Sometimes, and no offense meant to boys, boys can be a little more blunt and it doesn't seem so unusual, mm -hmm. but girls by fifth grade are really pretty savvy and they you know, would know exactly how to behave appropriately. So it, there was more of a contrast by making her a girl. Her behavior was more obvious. Um, the research you have to do for this book, just in general, how do you go about when you're starting your research? I research all the, the usual things, you know, books and um, 
uh, any kinds of, of sources, but for, for this in particular, I took workshops and did social stories, which are you know acting things out with somebody who's on the spectrum so they understand better how people expect them to behave. Um, uh, interviews, observing people, and of course my own daughter, but uh, really when I do research for a book, it's not just about something I personally know. I really have to broaden my research to cover uh, as much as possible to be authentic. How much time does that research segment take? Oh, wow. It can take a lot of time. And, uh, but I love research, so it's okay. I, that's part of the, the fun of writing. And I tell people that I use maybe 5% of the research actually in the book, but the rest of it informs my writing. And it may really only be a couple of percent of the research that goes, that you read actually in the book but it's all there you know, behind the scenes. Uh -huh. And uh, what's the order of event? Do you do all your research, done, then start writing? Or do you do a little research, a little writing, a little research? How does I it work? Kinda com I kind of combine them. I start with a lot of research, and then I'll go for a while, and I might hit a snag or something where I want to learn a little bit more, so I'll stop and do some more research, and then I'm ready to move on to the next section. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as knowing or nailing down uh, Asperger's or, and or autism, in talking to some teachers I know, they tell tales from the classroom of kids with autism, and I said, you know, that's a page right out of the book. <laughs> so how do you know you, you got it right? Well, I think I've had a lot of exposure, not just through my daughter, but, it, but other observations. and. Uh, there was also reference in one of those questions to maybe did the author have autism? And I will say that I think it was easier to write this book because I moved around a lot as uh -huh. a kid. And I really felt for Caitlin in the scene where she has to go into the cafeteria and try and make friends because I was always the, the odd person at a new school. Sometimes I talked funny because I'd come from another country. And you do feel like the odd person out. You don't really know the school or country's culture yet. So I, I, that was kind of a gift for me to know what it must feel like to really right. not understand the territory you're navigating. Right. Um, and while we're on the topic of the, the writing process, writer's block. Ah, uh, so yes. Does that happen? And what do you do? Sure. Uh, uh, for me, I either take a break and work on another project, or if I'm just kind of really stuck on things, I will uh, do something else that's physical but creative and artistic. It, it could be dance or cooking or just going for a walk. It, being out in nature really helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, also, asking yourself, what if? Because sometimes our brains just kind of get frozen up. And so you need to start asking really bizarre things, like what if a monkey came in here and started jumping on the desk? You know, <laughs> just to d be crazy. And then uh, you start coming towards things that make more sense and might actually be useful. And then the weirdest thing I do is I interview my characters. I talk to them, I ask them why they're behaving that way, why they're not getting along, what they thought was supposed to happen now because I thought it was this, but you're going this way. Right. And again, it's a way of kind of unlocking your brain. Uh -huh. And you just write down all their answers and eventually you come to a point where you think, oh, that's what's going on. Yeah. That, that trick has never failed me yet. Wow, that's great. Uh, we have a couple of emails we want to get to, but before we get to those, um, you mentioned you might go work on a different project. How many things are you working on at once? Uh, at least several. Mm -hmm. And there are different kinds of projects, like maybe a picture book and a novel in verse and a, a teen novel. And that way, if I get stuck on one or I'm in really in the mood to work on a picture book, I can go and do that. Right, it's nice right. to have that variety. It is nice. All right, we have an email, and it's actually about a, another one of your books. And it says, do you think you will write a sequel to The Absolute Value of Mike? And that Aww. one's from Rami. <laughs> That's so nice, Rami. I'm glad you like Mike enough to want to hear more about him. Uh, I 
probably will not write sequels to my books because I kind of feel like once I put a book out there, it becomes the readers, <coughs> and everybody reads it from their own background and perspective and probably have a different view of what happens to that character. I mean, I like to think Mike and his dad get along better and understand each other a little better and that his dad appreciates him more. Uh, but really, where he goes, I think that's up to the reader. All right, and uh, we have another email here that we'll throw up on the screen for you, and there it is. Why did you put such tense stuff in Mockingbird, like putting a school shooting in your book, or why do you put people with bipolar or Asperger's in your books? Well, that's because I think there are people out there who have these issues, and they, I want them to get heard. I want them to feel like there are books about them, and I want people who aren't familiar with those issues to become familiar and maybe gain a little empathy by reading a book about that. Uh, let's get back to Absolute Value of Mike for a second. Um, compare it with, with Mockingbird. How are they similar? How are they different? I suppose a, a one similarity is Mike's dad is probably on the spectrum. I mean, he does have some trouble communicating, and it was interesting to think about how an adult might deal with being on the spectrum, especially an adult who hasn't received a lot of help along the way, like hopefully we're doing with kids now, having some inclusion and understanding of where they're coming from. I would think that Mike's dad would have been a generation where he didn't get that, mm -hmm. and that kind of affects them. Um, as far as being different, Mike, it's the absolute value of Mike is a little quirkier and funnier than Mockingbird, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, in Mockingbird, you do a great job of letting us see inside Caitlin's head what she's thinking. But an another device you use is also the, the way the words are printed on the page. Mm -hmm. Some letters are capitalized where you wouldn't expect that. Just kind of take us through that and how, how it came to be. Yeah, I did notice that uh, some kids on the spectrum you don't follow those particular rules, if they think that there's a better way or a, a real good reason for something to be written a certain way, mm -hmm. then it should be that way. Right. And it just seemed to me that uh, Caitlin would want to capitalize the important words, things that were important to her, and maybe not feel the need to use um, quotation marks. I know that it makes it a little harder to read, but I kind of wanted that because I wanted right. people to have this constant visual reminder that the way she sees the world is a little awkward and a little different and, and can make you stumble sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think you were very successful in that. It was, <laughs> was a great device. Um, there are funny and sad moments in Mockingbird, but as one young reader said, it's, it's totally honest. Students have their own take, and let's take a look. The fact that the book is written about a shooting was surprising to me. I was a little shocked because it's like the raw truth of what has happened to these people and it helps you, it helped me understand more some of the pain that these people and like at Sandy Hook could have been going through and are still going through. It's very realistic. I mean, we both, we've had v um, VT, we've had Columbine, we have, we've had many school shootings in the past. So I feel like this is a very realistic situation, especially for the, for the dad, because I can imagine that the, that the parents that went through um, all of these shootings, whether fictional or not, um, all ha um, have these same grievance and emotions. This topic was chosen because it needs to be addressed. It, it's, um, people don't want to address it because it is very emotional, but that just proves that the emotions are there. Uh, even if people can't find this closure that was talked about in the book, um, it's important that we try anyway. This book shows how different people deal with grief. Even though grieving is a hard process and complicated, it shapes you and the way you view the world. Some well thought out reactions. Yeah. What are your reactions to what they had to say? Oh wow, I, I feel really honored to hear those kinds of remarks because that is what I want to do. I want to be honest and sometimes adults or gatekeepers don't feel like kids can handle the honesty, but I, I really believe in the kids' ability to um, be able to handle that. I really think they can, and I think 
imagining other things or it would just be worse. I mean, it's, be right. it's better to just deal with it openly and talk about it, and that way we can work through some of those issues. Yeah. Um, we talked about how you were kind of inspired by To Kill a Mockingbird as you wrote this, and now the local theater community was inspired by your book, and this has been turned into a play. So well, lots of questions about that. First of all, how do you go from, okay, this is my book and I'm so very proud of it, and now here I'm handing it over to you, and you have to totally trust you know, what they turn it into. Yeah, for me, I feel like uh, it's a totally different art form, mm -hmm. and it should be their, their forum. They should have the opportunity to interpret it the way they want and present it the way they want. Uh, so I, I kind of feel, not detached, but I, uh, but I do feel like it's their role. And I know as, as a writer, artist myself, I wouldn't want somebody else putting limits on my expression. So right. um, I, I, that makes me really want to let them have, have their go at it. Uh -huh. And, and you saw the final production. Yeah. What you, what'd you think? It was magnificent. Right. I was totally blown away. I really was so wonderful. I couldn't have asked for a better production. I, I mean, I didn't really know what to expect, uh, but I, I thought it was fantastic. And was there any of a, you're sitting there and the words you've written are now rolling out of their mouths, like, how did, how did we get to here? Oh, yeah. That <laughs> was just <laughs> kind of surreal. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, I love that. And especially when people would laugh, I think, wow, they thought that was funny, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. that commissioned the production of Mockingbird, and they generously provided a few clips for us to take a look at. Let's look at that now. I love your drawings, Caitlin. You're a very talented artist. Will you draw something for me? Today, we will begin our work on our group projects. Oh. Yes. Group projects can be about any animal you choose. Mrs. Brooke has switched the schedule again. I do not care for switching. I like things the same. From now on, I will have two recesses. The big kid recess and the little kid recess. Now you'll have a few minutes of recess with the little kids and then you can go back into your own classroom. If you have any trouble, you go to one of the teachers, okay? I'll protect you. You promise? Promise. Stop. I don't want to fight. I don't want any trouble. <laughs> Caitlin, you can be in our group if you want with me and Brianna and Shane. Okay. I told you, I am probably the best artist in the state. Yeah, right. Now, I've seen what Caitlin can draw. She's awesome. It's a good one, huh, Dada? Yeah, sweetheart. It's a really good one. Yeah. Wow, talk about uh, your words coming to life. What, did you have a favorite scene or a couple favorite scenes when you sat there and watched it? Oh, gosh. Um, I loved the classroom scenes. I thought uh, the actors were brilliant. I mean, they mm -hmm. really got the, that uh, kid repartee and the you know, concern or the making fun of or the jumping to the defense uh, just right. It was perfect. Uh, you said you think of uh, writing plays as a different art form. Have you ever thought about writing a play? You know, I think it would be fun to do a, a screenplay, but uh -huh. that, that I would have to take a class on that because I don't, <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so uh, we've got some more questions and tweets for you, and in just a moment we'll take a look at those, but for now, Meet the Author reporters go behind the scenes to find out how one work of art became another. Stay with us. Have you ever wondered how a book such as Mockingbird is transformed for stage? If so, it's best to go to the source. And that's exactly what I did with two other reporters from Robinson High School, Korean and Elza. We began our quest. 
days into rehearsal and met key players of the Mockingbird production. Yeah, right. Now, I've seen what Caitlin can draw. She's awesome. This is director Tracy Callahan. She says a good director understands the main themes of a play and how each character fits in. Actress Dylan Silver is the star of the show and protagonist of Mockingbird. It's her journey that an audience will follow. Actor Tony Mena plays Josh, Caitlin's arch rival. He says his character has misplaced energy. And Mrs. Brooks, the wise school counselor, is played by Gabriela Fernandez Coffey. When it's time for dress rehearsal, everything is so polished. The costumes, props, and set pieces are just right. And yet, most of the hard work takes place in the rehearsal room. It's here where the words of the playwright, Julie Jensen, come alive. It's Julie Jensen who shapes one art form into another. Ms. Jensen spoke with Korean and Elsa hours before the play's premiere at the Kennedy Center in Washington, well D.C. So what challenges did you face while transforming this novel to the stage? Well, it's too long, <laughs> for one thing. So I wanted it as narrow as I could get it in, in terms of compact. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, if you're, if you're talking about theater, you um, have economic issues. Um, do you want to do the play with 25 people or, as we are doing it, nine? Oh, wow. And the answer, if you are a theater, is always nine. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two sets of kids, and they're adults as well. And all of them are played by the ensemble. So the same people. And I defy you to know that oh, okay. <laughs> if you see it. But it, no, it's, it's a challenge. What makes Mockingbird a good novel to transform to the stage? I think the storytelling is, has so many aspects of, you know, just the journey of someone's life. And it, it, even though it's only over a certain period of time, it, it goes through almost every sort of like up and down that somebody can have and we see we see this young girl just you know she goes through disappointment but she you know she pushes through and she says she's very persistent you know she goes I might stop now but I'm very persistent and we see that through her persistence she she gets knocked down and stands back up again and we really see the fight in her and and just because she's she's trying to figure it out could you describe Caitlin for us Caitlin is a 11-year-old girl. She's extremely intelligent and observant. She has a way of methodically thinking through things in a way ch other children don't. Her sensory uh, abilities are very uh, hyper-aware. So there are several scenes where it's too loud, it's too weird, uh, people are too close to her. There, th th sudden things happen abruptly um, so that we're trying to capture what the world feels like for a kid on the spectrum. Mrs. Brooke has switched the schedule again. I do not care for switching. I like things the same. From now on, I will have two recesses. The big kid recess and the little kid recess. My character from the outside can be seen as a bully, but as we go through the story, we see that there's uh, an incident, which is a school shooting, um, that we get to go a little bit more into his life and why he's acting out, lashing out. So could you describe Mrs. Brooks for us? She is kind, warm, uh, very well-intentioned, uh, a little bit flustered at times, pretty human. Now you'll have a few minutes of recess with the little kids and then you can go back into your own classroom. If you have any trouble, you go to one of the teachers, okay? One of the scenes that's been most challenging has been a scene that happens early in the play between Mrs. Brooke and Caitlin, where Caitlin has a TRM, a tantrum rage meltdown. And we've been trying to find the sweet spot um, where we can tell that story, a sort of frightening moment, in a way that's dramatically interesting and true while not being too scary. I tend to like to, to um, have the audience like feel like they're really going on a physical journey with 
with the play. Um, and this is episodic in the sense that we go from the house to the to the recess to the interior of the school. And so it has these little tiny scenes. And when you think about that, that's purposeful, right? Um, the chapters aren't very long in the book. And so the so the author was saying, OK, we have these moments, right? I wanted to light here. She transitions. She's in another space. So we're really kind of spinning with through her life with her. And then as she starts to settle into her life, the place, you know, take, it goes a little bit slower in its orbit. And so we get that sense. It's sort of like a beating heart. And heart is really an important symbol in this play. And so it's sort of like this pounding heart, you know, and it moves and it moves. And then it slows down a little bit. And we start to focus in on, on Caitlin a little bit more. English teachers might say Caitlin's journey is part of a story arc. So could you elaborate on the term arc? The story starts here and ends here. And you follow a kind of, I like to think of it as kind of a little mountain or a little hill or something like that. The things that she encounters going up the hill are obstacles. It's not, the world is not gonna be easy. It's not a smooth path. It's a difficult path. The character, the main character is going up the hill, being challenged by various things as she goes up the hill, right? And then, if you think of the play as that trip up the hill, and then it ends not at the top, that's the biggest challenge of all. And then right after the top, right after that point, is the end, it's the settling, and it's, it, and so, if you see it graphically, it would go up like this and just over the top. And, and then that's the end of it. So that's how this, a story goes. Mm -hmm. Those encounters and that end. So you got to spend time with the playwright. One writer to another, did you learn anything from each other? Yes, I think I learned from her how to uh, be more succinct because I think she did a brilliant job of picking the most important scenes that still told a logical sequence of a story. Um, so I'm going to try to think like her when I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what's Kathy's take on the story arc? Uh, that's, I, you know, when we were doing that interview, I said, boy, what Julie said. She said that so well that it really is just getting over the hump, which for Caitlin was uh, finally getting her dad to work on the, the chest and finish the chest that um, Devin had been working on, and then decide to give it to the school, give it to try bring the community together. That was her effort for closure for the whole community, not just herself and her dad. Um, this book obviously raised awareness for Asperger's and autism. You know, anybody, it's hard to read it and not just become more aware. Was that one of the goals in writing this book? Definitely, yeah. yeah I did want particularly younger readers to have a chance to see from inside the head of someone on the spectrum because really I do think that when you get inside her head, there is a logic to the way she thinks and it doesn't seem quite so weird anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you have any thoughts at all about how, not responsible, but the role that the public schools play in raising awareness in, for autism? I think a number of them are doing a good job and more and more of them are trying to do some kind of inclusion, mm -hmm. which is great for all of the kids because we're, we all have to learn how to get along with each other and understand each other better. So uh, I think it's an excellent way to do it. Right. Uh, we have some tweets coming in, and so let's kind of backtrack a little bit. Did you always want to be a writer? I uh, always loved writing, but I didn't think anybody could be a writer. I thought you had to be some special kind of person, which you don't. Anybody can be a writer. We're really all writers. Uh, and it was just later in life that I realized, I, this is my passion, and I, I want to be able to finish, you know, go do my passion instead of just uh, my only my job, which it was being a lawyer, and which was okay, but I wasn't passionate about it. So. Uh -huh, right. Um, another question, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but when you decide, okay, I'm going to write this book, how do you get started? How does that whole process start? 
For me, it really is just these characters kind of come into my head and I, I hear them and I feel the setting. I sort of can see and feel where this is all taking place. Uh, they start having these conversations. I get a, an idea of what this book is about. What I don't know is the, the plot so much yet. Mm -hmm, I, that, mm -hmm. that kind of evolves. It takes a while for the plot to come. All right. Uh, let's find out what one special club at Robinson High School is doing to make a lasting impression for all students. My name is Nicole. I live in the Partners Club is a club for students with and without special needs. And we do service projects together and we also just have fun activities. My name is Joshua. Um, I love dogs. <laughs> So today was our first meeting this year, so we're kind of just trying to do icebreakers and get everyone familiar with one another. Uh, I like pizza. And we played a game called So Do I and Trainwreck, so people can learn things about each other and learn each other's names. I think the mission of the club is to just make everyone feel included, to have a place at school where anyone can come. You don't have to be a certain age, be athletic. There aren't cuts from the club. Like, everyone can come, you know? Everyone feels welcomed. My name's Corey, and I go to Robinson. We feel that we're one school, and everyone should feel included in that, and sometimes, obviously, you know, with your peers, not everyone is going to feel included, but I think here we, we do a really good job that everyone at least has a friend and somebody that can make them feel loved all the time. I feel like high schools are very separated with special education and general education, so we all have different teachers for the most part, and we don't see each other in the classroom as much, so we don't become close with people maybe in the special education program, so Partners Club kind of like bridges the gap between special education and general education and brings everyone together and also gives those students like the social life that they like need to have in high school. So it's just a good way to like bring everyone together. I think more high schools should have a program like it. I love coming to Partners Club. I, I think they're accomplishing their goal. Yes. Yeah, they're doing a great job. Um, let's shift gears a little bit to another one of your works, Badger Night. Tell us about Badger Night. That is a story of a, a boy who wants to prove himself and go off to battle and show that he's worthy because he has albinism, so he's very pale skin and hair, and uh, he's kind of suspect in the Middle Ages because he looks different. He's also kind of small and sickly, so he's uh, good going on a journey. But of course, I have to make life hard on my characters. Sure. So in his village, he's safe. But once he goes out of his village, because he looks so odd, he is in a lot of danger. Do you ever struggle with how difficult you're going to make it for your characters? I just make it tougher and tougher. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever boxed yourself in and it's hard to write yourself out of the predicament you put your character in? <laughs> I, I guess I don't make it that bad for them, but I do want to uh, put them to the test and really see what they can do. Yeah. All right, uh, focusing back on Mockingbird, a uh, few more student impressions about Mockingbird. Let's take a look. It was pretty well done in terms of, you know, um, ad like addressing um, like your issues that you know autistic children face, and also like it, it like it, it also does a great job of um, like of accurately um you you accurately um explaining how um autistic ch children sometimes you behave and think. Caitlin clearly is very intelligent. Um, she just sometimes doesn't know how to express herself. Everyone feels differently from their peers at one time or another. This is especially true and possibly more obvious when one has a disability. I can relate to this feeling because I have a condition known as cerebral palsy. Caitlin's peers make fun of her, but she is still herself despite what others think of her. When she was talking to Mrs. Brooks, her counselor, throughout the whole book, and I think that helps to teach children that adults are there for you in schools. I really liked the book Mockingbird. Um, something I really liked about the book was when Caitlin was searching for closure. The closure was the brother's chest that was unfinished. It meant a lot to um, the dad at the end and then the community and the school. Hey, 
And, and speaking of finding closure, how did you come up with that that was going to be one of the major themes you laced throughout this story? That just kind of came in organically. I didn't really know where I was going. I never know where I'm going with my stories. <laughs> <laughs> they just sort of evolve and it just feels like that, that, oh wow, that's that's probably what she should do. And I could see her doing that. And I could see her, maybe her dad not wanting that. And then and then it, it just sort of evolves. And, and as it evolves, how do you know when you're done? How do you know, okay, I'm done with this book? Yeah, that is hard because we want to keep tweaking it. But uh, for the last chapter of Mockingbird, my editor said, I think you need to revise it a little because I really want you to be crying at the keyboard. <laughs> and I thought, I, I don't cry at the keyboard. I'm not really sure what she's talking about. But then when I was writing it, I, I did kind of choke up at one point and I thought, oh, I guess this is what she means. I must be at the end now. Um, we have another tweet that's just in. Let's take a look at it. How does it feel to be an author who is inspiring to, who is inspiring to so many students? Well, thank you for saying that. I'm glad that, that you can be inspired by my work. Uh, I'm certainly inspired by other authors and, and what they do. And uh, it's a great feeling because I really write to connect with people and especially young people and to put some hope out there. And if that, is, that message is getting across, I'm delighted. Uh, an another tweet we have here is, What's your favorite character of all the characters you've created? Do you have a favorite? Oh, wow. Or a couple? That is so hard. Oh, my gosh. I think one of my favorite characters is Bo in Seeing Red. He's a, a developmentally delayed adult, but obviously very wise and caring human being. Um, if there's something you would want all your readers to come away from, from any of your books, what would it be? I think it would be that sense of hope that I want to give people, that no matter how bad things seem, and when you're young, there can be some really horrible things that happen, and you can feel like it's not going to get any better, mm -hmm. but it does. It really always does. As you and I know, we get through it. We're here, uh, so there is hope, and, and you will get through whatever it is. And as you said, it's always difficult when you've written them into a, a certain situation. You've got to get them out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But like Caitlin com comes out with flying colors. Um, you've given us a lot of advice here today. Uh, just give us a little bit more of, to all our budding authors out there. What would you want to tell them? I would say to read a lot and write a lot, which is probably what you're already doing, mm -hmm. and to share your work so that you get feedback because sometimes what we mean to say doesn't come out that clearly and so we need somebody else to tell us that so we can tweak it. And then eventually to start going to writers conferences and get to know some of your peers and some of the people in the industry and, and that you can do it. It may take a while, it took me a while, but you can do it. <laughs> And not to be afraid of the, the whole revision process, right? Oh, yes, because a lot of writing is revision. That's, that is really what's making it a better book the whole time or a better story. So it is well worth it. Yeah. Um, another thing uh, we were wondering is how long does it take to pick any of your books? How long did it take to start to finish? Well, if you include um, having it go through all of the acquisitions process at the publishing house and the um, publicity and the finding the covers from the art department, right, right. it takes a couple of years. And th that's at least a year and a half after you've submitted it. Uh, and then my stories vary a lot on how long it takes to write them. Mockingbird, the basic part of it, I wrote in about six weeks. Seeing Red, I looked on my computer and there were files from 1999 <laughs> and it didn't get published till 2013. So wow. <laughs> it's everyone has a different journey. All right. Well, it's been a great journey with you here today. Thank Thanks you, so Matt. much for being here. It's been great talking to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Meet the Author for the Fairfax Network. I'm Matt Fetters. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. <laughs>